The purpose of this discussion is to give you some more tools for your toolbox as you begin to analyze the stories in this course, but also to change your sensibility, to change the way that you think about a text when you begin to interrogate it and ask questions about it. We are going to be talking about three different things. Uh, script act theory is the first, reader response is the second, and reception theory is the third. Before we start, I want to provide you with a brief description here of analysis and interpretation so everybody's on the same page. Essentially, we need to begin by um, observing and describing, and the most important word here is how a text is organized and put together. And so in the initial stages of analysis, it really is based on your powers of observation. And so as you begin to look to how a text is organized, how it works, how it moves, what its main ideas are, that's going to set you up for offering your reader uh, a, a particular interpretation of the story. This whole process is called exegesis, which means to draw things out of the text. And you don't have to follow this strictly, but it's my suggestion for how you approach a text. The most important thing, in my opinion, is the theme. That is, what is the text trying to persuade me about? What questions is the text trying to answer? Those, if you remember from our discussion of Wayne Booth, those arguments in the text can be either a direct, such as telling, or indirect, such as showing. The theme itself is sometimes given away by motif. That is to say, recurring patterns of things. And that's where you begin to notice that there's a consistency here. And the more often certain elements of the text are repeated, the argument is the more significant it is to the text's meaning and to your interpretation. So for these reasons, you want to watch for recurring symbols, recurring phrases, recurring characters who do or say certain things. Anything that is repeated, by definition, is being elevated to a higher level of importance by the very nature of its repetition. So you begin to ask, how does the text go about persuading me of whatever the text is trying to persuade me of? The sequencing of ideas, the chronology of events, is very important, the ordering. And if you remember, we talked about different ways of uh, in which plot structures can be organized. And you should go back and review the uh, ingredients from that lecture to make sure that you understand those plot sequences because plot is really the mapping of the sequencing or the order of events. And all of that has to do with cause and effect and how the incidents of the story are evolved. Plot, if you remember, is primarily defined as the sequence of events plus causality. That's where you get characterization. That's where setting becomes important. And so you're looking to get a basic inventory of those things as you proceed. Apart from sequencing, the other important part of a text is structure. So sequencing is the order in which things occur. Structure is the importance uh, of different elements of the story. And fiction doesn't always begin with the most important point first, and the second most important point second, and the third most important point third. Your essays, which I'll talk about later on, have to do that. That's the particular genre of the essay, the academic essay. But a literary text or a cinematic text does not work that way. The most important points might be towards the middle or to the end. And structure has to do with importance. That can sometimes be signaled by frequency, which has to do with motifs over here. But uh, you can also get a sense of it as you work your way through the text. You should have some sense of it. 
what symbols and imagery are being used in the text and to what end. So as you begin to analyze and interpret your text, these are the questions that you need to have in mind, and this is the framework. I move now to our first topic, and it sounds like it's really obvious, but it's not. Is there such a thing as the text? That is to say, a single monolithic reading of a text that is correct, and all the other readings are not correct. Or are there only texts, that is to say, only anarchy or solipsism, which means each interpretation is unique? Well, the answer to this question, it's a rhetorical question and it's a false question. The answer is really neither. There is no such thing as the text. There are multiple possibilities of how to interpret a text, depending on who the reader is, depending on what the reader's experience literary or otherwise life experience is when they come to the text, and depending on many other things, your gender, your sexual orientation, your social class, all influence what things you see in a text and what things you exclude or marginalize and which things you ignore. So the idea that there is a single reading is false. The other idea is also false, namely that you can basically say anything you want to say about a text and you're good to go. That is not true. There are a range of interpretations, always based on specific textual evidence, by which I mean short quotations of single words or short phrases. Those satisfying interpretations are all supported with evidence from the text not from outside the text, but from actual things that characters say and do, or the particular way in which the story is narrated. So you can't just say anything you want. There's a range of interpretations that are um, more appropriate than others. And depending on what century you're in, there's a range of interpretations that are more in favor while others are out of favor. So these are things that we have to keep in mind. For example, in the 40s and 50s and 60s, there were very few feminist interpretations of a literary text of any kind. In this day and age, you, can't, you have to deal with feminist interpretations of text. There's no other choice. Same with queer studies, with environmental studies. These are all different ways to approach a text. We begin with the notion of whether it's an addition of a text or not, when we get to Shakespeare in this course, you'll see that there were several editions of Shakespeare's plays during his lifetime, each of which was significantly different from the others. But depending on which edition or version of the same text, or whether a text is morphed into another medium, that's to say whether it moves from novel to film, it becomes evident that there are as many stories as interpretive versions. And this is the key point I want you to understand here. The words on the page are like a skeleton without flesh. They are a mirror that reflect back to us what we want to see. The meaning of the text is not in the text. The text is simply like a Rorschach test. I think you know what a Rorschach test is. I don't know if I spelled that right, but it'll come up. Um, yeah, so a Rorschach test is basically an abstract uh, piece, ink block, that basically looks like this. And the viewer is invited to say what they think they see there. So if you see a butterfly, that's fine. If you see a bat, that's something else. If you see a satanically, um, a demon with, you know, large horns and a kind of devil figure, these are all different possible interpretations. The text is the text. The meaning comes from us, the reader, not from the text itself. And so script act theory begins with this phenomenon that there are many different interpretations and that each time a version or an edition or a film of that text is brought to life. It is somehow unique and different, and I would suggest, in a lot of cases, influenced by 
contemporary thinking uh, around particular issues. Um, I have a note here too that says when you study the history of different interpretations of the text, that's reception theory. So what did 17th century audiences think of Othello? What did 18th century audiences think of Othello? What do current African audiences think of Othello? How do they see the play differently from white North American readings of the play? And if you look at the history of how different audiences react, that's reception theory. So the three things we're talking about, script act theory basically says the text is a Rorschach test. The text is a Rorschach test where we bring our meaning to it. That is reader response. When you do a history of reader responses over time, it's called reception theory. So let's zoom in a little bit now and talk about script act theory. This is um, from chapter three in a book by Peter Schillingsberg called From Gutenberg to Google. There is um, everything that follows here. I've uh, copied and pasted from the link. And this is a DOI document object identifier of that particular uh, website. And so uh, I don't have quotations around here, but I want you to understand I've just lifted this material unless it says summary by Pellucci and then that's my voice. But this is an interesting comment on script act theory. In order for developers of new electronic representations of print literature, whether they're computer technicians or technical scholars, to know what to do and what to create, there needs to be a fuller, more nuanced understanding of the nature of script acts. By script act, I do not mean just those acts involved in writing or creating. And this is the traditional way of thinking that I'm trying to move you away from, that I, the author, write something and I enshrine it in some kind of medium, paper, pen, uh, computer, digital format, whatever it is, and you interpret it. It's more complicated and unfortunately a little bit messier than that. He means by script act theory, every act conducted in relation to written and printed text, every act of reproduction and of reading, so script act theory not only involves the creative process of making up a text, but the critical process of receiving it and we create our own meaning for what the text says. And our meaning may or may not have anything to do with what the author's intentions are. And I've talked about this before. We really don't talk about authorial intention in this course. We talk about what the texts actually do. So, um, one of the implications for script act theory is that no single copy represents a work in the same way that the other copy represents it. Each time you have a different edition or a different version, it is a brand new game. And so my paraphrase of it is that the gist of script act theory is that written words on the page can have an infinite number of possible interpretations, uh, one expressed in the printed edition or in other, whether regardless of whether it's expressed in print or in other media. The idea is that the written language, our script in English, has very little to do with expression. So Schillingsberg, for example, talks about, you know, in music we talk about tempo and pitch and inflection and cadence and volume and intonation. And we have some signifiers of this in the English language, such as a question mark that tells us our cadence, the voice cadence needs to go up at the end because we're asking a question, and exclamation marks which require intensity or enthusiasm. But music notation has many more opportunities to encode all kinds of signals about how we are to interpret that particular music. So the words on the page really don't mean anything. And the example I have here, I can look at words on a page, something like, don't you look nice today? The words on the page don't tell me anything about the tone. If I say, don't you look nice today? That seems to render itself as an authentic compliment. But I could say, don't you look nice today? Implying a kind of sarcastic tone which is not encoded in the words on the page. So the words on the page don't tell me how to say it, they only tell me what to say. 
And the difference between the what on the page and the how is the most important part of your understanding as you begin to approach texts and, and interpret them. It's the how that's everything. <coughs> All right. So communication happens, and this is my enhancement of um, Schillingsburg. So communication happens normally from person to person using three different channels. <coughs> um, in written, it's only the words on the page and the language. But there's two other methods. Uh, those other methods are uh, body language and expression, which are paraverbal uh, tonalities that go along with it. And so these other um, dimensions of, of um, uh, interpretation become very, very important. <coughs> and from one text to the next, they're going to make a big difference. So this is right from uh, Schillingsburg himself. He says, script act theory is developed in this book, adopts two rather unconventional premises about reading and writing. The first concept is that written works entail three ideas. First, that a literary work is only partially represented in its physical manifestations. <coughs> Excuse me. So the book I have or the page I have or the paper I have is only one part of what that text is. The second, that any point in a work, even a very long one, readers can take in or handle more than one version of a work at the same time, meaning when we read a text, we can be aware of ambiguities, that <coughs> something could be either sarcastic or not sarcastic. We don't have to reduce the text to something very simple. <coughs> the second concept is that Central to script act theory is that reading any work, especially works longer than a few lines, never takes place as a whole, but is rather like taking a canoe ride down a long river with a flashlight. We pass through the text only seeing individual different moments at a time. And that has to do with the exegesis that I was talking about. You need an inventory of the sequencing of events before you can zoom out and put together the whole structure of how it all works. Let's talk now about reader response. So um, we know from script act theory that the text is a shell <coughs> that we, the readers, begin to fill out. So reader response is a particular approach to literary criticism that has a number of, I'm going to call it different flavors. So here, if you happen to be a Freudian, you would use a psychoanalytic lens. If you're a Jungian, you would use Carl Jung's psychology. Feminist, structuralist, um, queer studies, environmental studies, these are all different approaches. But the whole point about reader response is that we're, the reader response approach is not to be interested in the historical conditions under which the text was created. We simply, I, Peter, read the text and react to the text only on the basis of what I read on the page. So I'm not going to read the author's biography. I'm not going to go back and read um, the history of uh, the Middle Ages in order to understand, you know, the feudal system and how it impacted Arthur's knights and, and uh, storytelling back in the Middle Ages. I'm not going to do any of that. I'm just going to read the text and document how I react to that text. And so reader response is a kind of a, a tunnel, a cone, between the reader and the text with nothing else around it. Um, so for reader responses, they are looking for how does this text speak to me? How does it make me feel? What does it make me think as I move through it? And in reader response analysis, you're documenting your own reactions to the text as much as you are documenting what happens in the text, if you understand that distinction. Because quite often, one of the things that 
matters to us is how the text is put together, regardless of what I think. That is a kind of what's called structural analysis of the text or a script act theory reading of the text. But how I react to it is a reader response. Okay. So uh, this is from, um, um, I think it's a Wikipedia site, but anyway, uh, this is Lois Tyson talks about five different kinds of reader responses. The a transactional one is what I was talking about between the text inferred meaning and the individual interpretation by the reader influenced by their personal emotions and knowledge. That's almost a psychological uh, <clears throat> study of how I am reacting to stimuli in the text. Affective stylistics believe that the text only comes into existence as it is read. This is an interesting theory, that on the page, the text has no meaning whatsoever. There is no such thing as a text. It only comes to life when I start reading it. And whether I'm reading it as a reader or reading it as an actor who's going to have to deliver these lines, the whole point about effective stylistics is the meaning is in me, not in the words on the page. That's Stanley Fish, um, the uh, great critic in the 60s and 70s who first um, came up with this idea. The subject of reader response looks entirely to the reader's response for literary meaning as individual written responses compared to a text and then compared to other interpretations to find continuity of reading. Psychological reader response um, looks at the motives for why you want to read a text and how the characters work. And finally, um, in his later career, Stanley Fish revisited his earlier uh, notion about affective stylistics, stylistics and basically zoomed out a little bit to include now any individual interpretation of a text that is created in an interpretive community of minds. So if I'm going to go back and look at how they read this text in the 1920s, He's not going to go back and look at just what Peter Pellucci, the individual, thought about the text. He's going to go back and take a look at what white Caucasian elderly males with high levels of education in North America thought about this text. And social reader response is almost at the edge of reception theory, which is how groups of people over time have looked at it. So the difference between social reader response theory and reception theory is that Fish's social reader response looks at one moment in time only. How did Pellucci in 1995 interpret this text as a member of his age, gender, uh, education level, ethnicity, and all of that? The history of many Pelluccis over many different decades in time is reception theory. Reception theory shares the same idea. There's no single meaning in any text. There are multiple meanings. And the key to reading a text, as I said earlier, is that you have to be able to entertain multiple interpretations of the text at the same time. You don't want to be reductionist and reduce the text to one single meaning because then you oversimplify. So you need to be able to read the text in two different directions at the same time, up and down and left and right at the same time, recognizing that on the one hand, this interpretation is legitimate, but on the other hand, it isn't. Uh, when I teach Hamlet, for example, if you have read that play in high school, one of the big recurring questions in Hamlet is, why does Hamlet delay for such a long time? There's all kinds of good psychological and epistemological reasons for why that is true. But if you read the play politically, there is no delay at all because Hamlet waits until he gets the proof positive that Claudius has murdered his father. And at that point in the big uh, duel at the end of the play, as soon as Claudius confesses, Hamlet stabs him. It takes like 10 seconds. And so you can read the play both ways at the same time, even though the meanings are contrary to each other. And this is a skill that I want you to be able to practice. And so if you find yourself reading a story that seems to have two or more different and even opposing interpretations, don't try to reduce it to one and ignore the other. 
retain the tension and keep both of those readings at the same time. So what reception theory does is look at the evolving historical tradition of interpretations of a work over time. And this is something you may want to approach. Uh, there'll be opportunities for you to practice in the Moodle participation forums, but also in your essay uh, when it comes up uh, in this term. So that is the idea of reception theory. Um, finally, I'll come to um, Wheeler's point about reception theory. It's not a question of which reader, and I've added a note here, or reading, is correct. The question is meaningless because, let's, we're taking the example of Cicero. Cicero is dead and cannot tell us what the text means. But even if Cicero could be resurrected to tell us what he intended, Cicero could not have predicted the larger context of history after he wrote that text. Cicero could not have anticipated World War I, World War II, the atomic bomb, um, the hippies movement, the current pandemic. All of these historical changes don't happen without consequences. The text that he wrote can be picked up again and again and again and re-examined with each new generation. And I want you to think about this because Think about the discipline of history. If, if history could be told just on the facts alone, there would be only one history or historical account of World War II. That would be it. It started here, this happened, it ended there. And there would be no need to have another book ever again about the Second World War. But there are multiple books about World War II coming out every couple of months, every year, every decade hundreds, thousands of new books on World War II, because some of the facts change. We discover facts that weren't there. But also, as we begin to talk about causality between effect and cause, we start to see things differently based on our current experience and knowledge. And so I want you to walk away from this discussion with this final point in mind. We're talking about stories in diverse media. And we know for a fact that as the stories migrate across different media, they are in one sense going to conform to the original story. They're going to be consistent and repeat the central ingredients of the original story and the genre. But there's also going to be a tension between what, they, what the stories keep the same and what they change. And what they change is as important as what is kept the same. Same with history. We know what happened in the Second World War, but we have to keep rewriting it because we're discovering new things. And so readers cannot purge their own knowledge or recover the exact mindset of an author. We can't get inside Cicero's head. Even if he left an autobiography or a diary or a video a living will of what he was thinking, we still can't get into his head because we're not living in his individual head and we're not living in that time and place. So you, the reader, they, should realize that you bring something of your own to the text when you read and embrace that individualistic response. I always remember one of my undergraduate professors telling me this, books read the reader. Meaning, when you offer an interpretation of a text, it's saying more about you than it is about the text that you are interpreting. And similarly, when creative people redo another version of a, a narrative, a story, it tells us more about the teller of the story or the reteller of the story than it does about the story itself.